This is episode 66 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this podcast, well, we have a whole smorgasbord of magic history. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for all things magic history. I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 66. So, oh my gosh, so many things going on. Uh, I've been <laughs> I've been a little absent again from the podcast because I have so many projects. Um, this has nothing to do with magic history. I'll just tell you what I'm doing. Uh, I have a, a about. 50 some shows this summer, uh, and I'm performing virtually at summer camps doing a show about space. So I'm actually trying to recreate the whole uh, concept of uh, performing like I'm performing on the moon, basically. And that's taken up quite, quite a bit of my time. And thankfully, I did the first one last week and it was a big success. So I'm looking forward to a whole bunch more. So now that I got that uh, all the preparation for that out of the way, I can get back to the podcast. And I did decide to preempt the Amadeo Vaca um, podcast just just by one, just because um, I didn't think it would fit in here with everything I had in store. So so we'll do that one next uh, next episode. One thing I do want to mention is Genie Magazine, the June issue of Genie Magazine, and whoa. It has Kalanag on the cover, Kalanag, the great German illusionist. Oof, where do I even start? Well, first off, I got my copy of Genie Magazine in the mail in a white envelope, <laughs> which I was like, what happened there? And then I opened it up, and inside was, uh, of course, the whole magazine, but on the cover was Kalanag with a big red swastika on his face, and I, I couldn't help but wonder, okay, what's going on here? Is this... Um, is there a postal regulation that doesn't allow that kind of thing to go through the mail, maybe? Or was uh, the, the folks at Genie just being uh, kind to people, trying to, you know, just keep this under wraps? Um, I don't know. But uh, I will say that um, for me personally, Kalanag keeps coming up um, almost every podcast. When I did the Kastner podcasts, Kalanag was there all the time because he was he and Kastner were they lived at the same time they were both members of the German magic circle so I kept coming across Kalanag's name and I had intended to do a podcast on Kalanag uh, sometime this year but now with the genie issue that came out I may I may postpone it I'm not sure now one thing I wanted to say as far as the um, the controversy over the cover I'm in the camp that says more than likely had they not put the uh, the big red swastika on the cover, you know, on Kalanag's face, um, they probably would have had less people reading that article. And with it on there, I have a feeling that a lot of people read the article on Kalanag, which is great. Um, the basis of the article, it comes from a new biography coming out on Kalanag by a German author, and it's being published for the public over there in German by Penguin Press. Uh, I wish, uh, or I wish and hope that we get an English translation here in the States because uh, I think it would be fantastic. But you get to learn um, a little bit about Kalanag when you read the article. There's a lot more, trust me, there's a lot more. And he's certainly a very controversial figure. If you don't know anything about him, you're going to find out some things that are uh, quite astonishing within the article that's in Genie. And I, if you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. And the great thing is there's a lot that they didn't tell you uh, in that article. So maybe I will do a podcast later in the year on Kalanag because there's, there's an aspect that they didn't cover that I think would be uh, really interesting to everyone that is a listener of the podcast. So there's that. So um, also, I do need to mention here really quickly, in case you've gone over there, my, my blog, themagicdetective.com, is down. Um, it's something to do with Google, and it's uh, just trying to reach Google is um, 
a pain in the you know what. But it will be back, and I, hopefully in the next day or so, it'll be be back up. So, so there's that. It's just, it's been taking up all my time trying to reach them in any number of different ways, and not hearing anything back. So. So there's that. Um, I, I did want to uh, start out the podcast today with a, with a story. And this is actually a story from, from my life. Yay. Uh, it's just kind of an interesting magic history story or a fun magic history story. And I'm not going to give you the exact date, but suffice to say, happened a number of years ago. I was on vacation with, uh, with my mom and my dad and my brother. And it was a family vacation to Minnesota to see the relatives. Uh, And I don't remember if it was on the way back or on the way there, but uh, we were going to stop in Colon, Michigan to go to Abbott's Magic Shop for the first time and hopefully while there meet the uh, famous Neil Foster. Um, Neil Foster was running the Chavez College of Magic at the time and I wanted to attend and I thought, well, you know, we'll stop at Abbott's and see if they have his address and then we'll go over and meet him and you know, sure, that's what everybody does, right? Uh, and well, as it turned out, we went to Abbott's and I told him, who, you know, who I was and what I wanted, you know, what I was looking for. I was, you know, wanted to attend the Chavez College, but uh, I needed to meet Neil Foster. And fortunately for me, they were uh, kind enough to give me his address. And they said, but you better get over there quickly because he's getting ready to go to Japan on a, uh, a performance tour. And sure enough, we drove over there, and he had his luggage right there by the front door. And um, so he he was indeed getting ready to go somewhere, that's for sure. But he was kind enough to let me in along with my dad, and we talked to him for a few minutes. And he wanted to find out how serious I was about magic. And it didn't take too long to uh, discover how serious I was. And we went to the basement and saw where... He taught the classes in manipulation magic, and I hadn't even sent an application in yet, but he told me, send it in, you're accepted, and, uh, and that was that. And then uh, after, we uh, we went back to Abbott's, and I purchased a book that I had not seen before. It's called The Illustrated History of Magic by Milborn Christopher. And so I was very excited about that. I couldn't have spent the whole vacation reading that book. I loved it. And um, but also while there, well, they had flyers for the American Museum of Magic, which was only about I think I forget I think it was about forty minutes away or so. And we we left Abbott's and decided to drive to Marshall, Michigan, and again unannounced. Uh, they were closed when we arrived, but we knocked on the door and uh, Bob Lund answered the door, and he had gotten a call from Abbott's about a young man, very eager, uh, very eager magic enthusiast that was on his way up with his family. And, um, well, because of the heads up, we were able to get a, a tour of the museum. And one of the things, well, there were a number of things that stood out. One was his, uh, he had a library in this very narrow room. And I remember the the books going from, not quite the floor, but uh, about waist high all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, there's so many magic books, I couldn't believe it. And uh, seeing that, I was like, one day I hope to have that many books or more. I'm still working on that. But it was a, an impressive display. I also remember uh, Houdini's milk can and a couple of the big brass buckets that were used in the water torture cell. And I want to say, and I could be wrong about this one, there was an overboard packing case there too, but I might be wrong about that. I might be thinking of another place that I went. Um, one thing that did surprise me was Bob Lund was not a fan of Houdini at all, uh, but he did know about the the draw that Houdini had, so um, that's why he had that stuff, and he had it up near the front, so when people came in, that's what they saw right off the bat. Suffice to say, it was a most incredible day meeting Neil Foster, going to Abbott's, and then finishing off with the American Museum of Magic. It's like the the magic history trifecta. I thought you'd enjoy hearing that little story. This month, I'm going to be doing a book review on the new book by Mark Cannon called Lincoln's Scout. 
It's the diary of Horatio Cook, soldier, spy, escape artist. It's a self-published book. And from, and now keep in mind, this is my opinion. There's uh, some things I don't like about the book up front. Just let me tell you those really fast. First, it's a, it's a big trade paperback. Um, I, I would have preferred a hardbound book. Sorry. Uh, second, the text is very large. There are no chapters. Instead, they're kind of like sections, but no chapters. And that kind of threw me off a little bit. And uh, so maybe you're thinking I didn't like the book at all. And I'll be honest with you. I I actually love the book. Uh, besides those, you know, little nitpicky things, I thought the book was really, really good. Uh, Mark Cannon chose a very interesting way to tell the story. And, and he begins by explaining how he got involved in this to begin with, because he has uh, some personal involvement. And this book came about because of a promise he made to uh, Horatio Cook's daughter. So he explains that whole thing. Then he discusses Cook's personal diary, which he had transcribed. Now, what's unfortunate about this the overall story is Cook's diary has vanished uh, since Mark first had it. Mark transcribed it, gave it back to the family, and then somewhere along the way, it, it's now gone. We don't know where it is, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but he goes on uh, taking the, some of the various claims that Harry Cook had and trying to prove their validity or show that they may be less than factual. And there, there are some holes in Cook's life, uh, or maybe we should maybe not say holes, but mysteries that um, they don't quite add up, but, you know, with a little bit of uh, proof, you, you know, they would be great. Uh, Mark really delved deep in, in, in tr to trying to show that uh, Cook's claims were legit. Sadly, some of the proof he had in his possession, some of the things that could have proved it. For example, he had a, a letter from Abraham Lincoln that he carried with him at all times, um, and the letter basically said, you know, I am making you one of my personal scouts, signed Abraham Lincoln, whatever, you know, other context there was in there or content there was in there. But he always carried it with him. And then when he got captured by Mosby's Raiders, they took the letter. So the proof of that was taken by the Confederates. And there were other things that, you know, again, could have... Uh, could have done more to prove some of the things that Cook had alleged. But um, through the research, Mark did a really fine job of, uh, uh, of proving most of the claims. Now, one thing I did like about the book were the reproductions of the various newspaper articles, letters, programs, and such that, uh, that came from Cook's scrapbook, which is different than his, bio, uh, than his diary. And these were all in full color. So that's really uh, amazing. On a personal note, I own a Cook playbill that uh, the version thereof appears in the, uh, the book. Mine is a little bit longer. It has some more writing on it. Uh, it's possible it's the same version that's in that book. It, the one that's in the book may have been trimmed or cropped, as it were, to, uh, to fit on the page. And I've always found the Cook story fascinating. And I guess for the last, I don't know how many years, I've been the sole water carrier for the Cook story since Mark first wrote about it in Mum uh, many moons ago. Uh, my interest in the story was due to the fact that I grew up in the very region that most of these events took place, the Civil War areas in Virginia, West Virginia, and Maryland. That's where I grew up. That's where I'm from. And I've spent time in all these towns and that are mentioned in the book and very familiar with Ford's Theater and the boarding house across the street where Lincoln died. Um, here's a bit of trivia for you. The, uh, the E Street Cinema Theater, which is right around the corner from all that, apparently one of the theaters is right underneath the, um, the boarding house where Lincoln passed away. That's a, I learned that from the E Street Cinema Theater people. All right. Also growing up, my art teacher, her name was Miss Mosby. She was a direct descendant of John Singleton Mosby, the great ghost 
John Mosby, who figures prominently in Cook's story, is buried in Warrington, the town where I went to high school. And his home is there. Uh, His home was turned into the Mosby Museum, again, also in Warrington, ran continuously until 2018 when it was sold. Um, I have no idea what happened to the artifacts that were in the museum. I'm assuming they went to the, uh, the Fauquier County Historical Society, I hope, but I don't really know. Uh, I've often wondered if that letter that uh, was taken from Harry Cook might be among the things in that museum. That would be such an, an amazing find if, um, if it was still there. Now I don't know. don't know where to even look. Uh, also growing up, I had a, a friend whose last name was Cook, who may or may not have been related to Harry, but I also have another friend who is a direct descendant of Harry Cook. Uh, He was her great-great-uncle, I believe. So I have a lot of connections to the Cook story. And I I believe I was the first to write about Cook online via my blog, themagicdetective.com, but I always made sure to credit Mark Cannon whenever I shared the story, either by blog or podcast or whatever. And speaking of the podcast, episode 16 is where I cover Harry Cook. And to my dismay, because I just listened to it again the other day, I gave the wrong date of his death on the podcast. He died on June 23rd, 1924, which is just a few days from now. But I said he died on June 17th, and I have no idea where that date came from. It was a total mistake on my part, Uh, and my notes say June 23rd, and I just blurted out June 17th. I have no idea. Anyway, back to the book. Often when you read a book, you wonder, who is the audience for this book? And I can tell you that the audience really, in a way, is one person, and that's Clara Louise Wassum the daughter of Harry Cook. And that's the person that entrusted Mark to tell her father's story. But this book is great for historians that cover Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, magic history, Houdini history. And I'll be honest, I've always thought this story would make an awesome movie. But this book isn't written quite like that. It's not like, you know, a, a narrative story. It, 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 it takes different pieces of history, but um, it's not quite that kind of book. But anyway, it, it's a very serious history book relating the events of Horatio Cook's life. One thing I did learn, or maybe I should say got clarification upon, was the idea that Cook was Houdini's mentor or a mentor to Houdini. I'd heard this and assumed it was because Cook was an escape artist before Houdini was even born. Maybe, uh, maybe even the first escape artist, but their connection isn't really because of that. It's because Cook was one of the first spirit exposers. Uh, Harry Cook had a show called Spiritualism Without the Aid of Spirits. And during the show, he presents several cabinet routines, the London galvanometer test, a handcuff escape, a clairvoyant routine, and more. His show uh, was basically to show that these tests could be done via natural means without any aid of spirits. Hmm. Sounds kind of like Houdini, doesn't it? Thus, there was a connection. And Houdini was intrigued with Cook's knowledge of spiritualistic effects. And the two shared many hours together discussing and sharing these uh, different effects. In fact, Houdini credits Cook numerous times in his book, A Magician Among the Spirits. And he also presented an autographed copy of the book to Harry Cook after it was published. There are a number of photos of Houdini and Cook together, so it's clear that both Harrys admired each other greatly. Also featured in the story is Harry Keller. As he and Cook were good friends, they lived in the same area. It's kind of funny what Clara had to say about Harry Keller, but I'll leave that to the readers to discover. All in all, I greatly enjoyed this book. And forget about my nitpicky comments at the beginning. These are common things that happen when you when you self-publish. And honestly, 
not all of them are really so bad. The large print, for example, hey, made it much easier to read. I didn't need my glasses. <laughs> so I can't really complain too much on that. Uh, Mark Cannon more than lived up to his commitment to Clara Louise Cook Wassum. He also gave magic historians a valuable reference book on the life of a very, very interesting man, Horatio Green Cook. Where can you get the book? Go to Amazon.com and type in Lincoln's Scout or uh, Lincoln's Scout by Mark Cannon and uh, it will come up. That's where I got my copy. And I would encourage you very much to go get a copy because I think you will really enjoy the story. And I'd like to add one more bit of clarification on my part. I said I was uh, probably the, the water carrier for the Cook story uh, since Mark wrote his article in Mum. Uh, when I say that, I'm, I'm referring basically to in the magic world. I do know that there were several people that wrote articles for historical magazines and such uh, that were not magic related. I know this because they contacted me and then I had them speak to Mark. I, I always gave everybody over to Mark because he had the, uh, the bulk of the knowledge. He had the cook scrapbook and some other things. So I thought he was the best source to go to in that regard. So I just wanted to clear that up and, um, there you go. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please uh, like the podcast in whatever way your podcast provider will allow. Uh, if you're so willing to give us a five-star review on Google Podcasts, uh, that would be, or was it Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts or either? That would be great. I would love that. And uh, until next time, I am Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Please be well and be safe.